first yes. speaker, uh, Maximiliano Mantion. Yeah. Hello, so I'm going to talk about Metascript, which is a language that compiles to, Dab to JavaScript that I implemented. And so five minutes, one programming language, this will be a bumpy ride. Quickly about myself, uh, I'm an enthusiast software engineer, passionate about languages. I worked in JIT compilers in the V8 team in Google and JIT compilers in general for a lot of time. And so why a new, comp a new programming language? What's the problem with JavaScript? Well, there are many problems, we know. And there are already many languages that address them, but each of one focuses a few selected issues. And this was the problem for me. I wanted to tackle more of them. So JavaScript is a wicked language. We know uh, conversion rules can kick in with obvious results and forgetting a verbal declaration can be a real problem and it doesn't really have block scoping until ES6. And uh, it has a verbose syntax which can be a problem for somebody. And Metascript fixes this, let's say, coffee script style. Declarations have block scoping but the style is like that. Then Metascript is a functional style so there are no statements, only expressions. And uh, even loops are defined by tail recursive expressions, which are translated into plain loops. So uh, there are parallel, parallel assignments, and this means, in general, less temporary variables. Everything composes nicely. And it can also optionally use closed script read only data structures with the Mori library. It has macros to do that. I mean, it works essentially natively. And then there's the issue of a type system. I'll just say quickly, this is still a work in progress, but I'm doing a type system which will be mostly compatible with the TypeScript one. So if those that like these things, this will, it will be there. And then there is the thing that is most important for me, it's metaprogramming. Uh, ClojureScript and Lisp dialects in general have this, but Lisp dialects can be really uncomfortable to many people. All those parentheses can hamper people. But Lisp style macros are incredibly powerful and they're really underrated. And Metascript fixes this with a uniform AST, even if it has support for infix syntax. And it also has hygienic macros. So essentially it's like a Lisp with a Ruby-like syntax, sort of. And it is a good JavaScript citizen in the sense that it designed for zero runtime overhead. It's just translate to plain JavaScript. And uh, each core concept translates just one to one and uh, consuming existing modules in Node with require or with everything is just a one-liner, it's normal, and even producing modules is just the usual thing, and it has full source map support, map support. so it's just a good JavaScript citizen. Now, a taste of the language very quickly. Uh, these are just simple expressions, so you see it's readable. You can use the dot operator, you can call things, you can pass arguments, and uh, the usual expressions in infix mode just work, so you can just write expressions and evaluate them, and they do what you would expect. And there are no statements, so uh, you can just write expressions and get their value and go on, and uh, when you have a sequence of things to do, this do, then you take the last value and it just works. And loops are also expressions. This is the classical example of a factorial, uh, which looks like a recursive function, but is translated into a loop. And then here we have macros in action. So this is a recording of uh, live coding with, uh, with our editor, uh, with our environment. You, you can uh, look at objects. And um, so this is a simple object with a couple of methods. It's a vector. And uh, so there's the modulus, which is the length, and you can evaluate it. And there's the scale, which changes, obviously, uh, x and y. And uh, you can invoke it, and then you can re-evaluate it, and you see that it works. But now, what if we wanted to have an add operator like Ruby or uh, CoffeeScript? Then I write it, and it doesn't work, of course, because it's not there. But then what I can do is write a very simple macro that extracts the, compi extracts the compiler how to do that, and then it works. And now I'm going to show how you can simplify. So what if I don't want to write function arguments and just have placeholders with the, the order? I can just do it, and it is a very simple expression. And then why use indentation? This is very small. I want to use a single line with, uh, with parentheses. Then I can do it. So the language interprets either indentation or blocks with parentheses, and it just works. And even with these changes, just going live, uh, I can, oh, another macro for exp. So I can define another operator, and uh, I can replace math.pow with this operator, and it still works. So now I can reevaluate and evaluate the values, evaluate the modulus, evaluate the scale, and uh, so call the scale, and it's going on. This is what we use every day at work, essentially. So these were simple macros, uh, but five minutes gone. 
but more useful ones would be other operators, matter functions. My mic on. Thank you. Excellent. Matthias Burs. Hey, I'm uh, Matthias. I'm a JavaScript hacker from Copenhagen. Uh, I do a lot of Node stuff. Uh, recently, I've been playing around with uh, BitTorrent, because that's awesome, uh, especially in Node. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a module I did called TorrentStream. Uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, what TorrentStream basically does is, is it allows you to take a torrent and uh, use it from Node in real time as a Node stream. So you can kind of like have a torrent that consists of 10 gigabyte of data and use it in, in one second and just stream the parts you need. So I'm going to try to demo this today. And I want to say, please don't try to run this demo, because we'll probably kill the network. So um, I cheated a little bit and preloaded some of the data. So, so this is just an example of how it works. You basically just um, call turn stream with a magnet link. And when the swarm is ready, when it has the actual torrent, I'll just print out uh, the files in the torrent. So that's cool. So yay. So this is Star Trek fan fiction. Um, it has two files, a text file and an AV file. So what if we tried to stream the text file to, to standard out? That would be super cool. So we just do this by calling a read stream on the file. And even though we haven't downloaded anything, we'll just start streaming out to the to standard out. So that should be pretty cool if it works. So let's try it out. So I'm just going to run this program. Yay. So what actually happened here is that TorrentStream connected to the swarm of peers. There's like a lot of peers all around the world and started pumping out the data as it received it. Like it hadn't really downloaded anything. So this is, this is kind of cool for text, but you know, Torrents has a lot of different stuff. And if you remembered, the file, uh, the torrent also had like an AV file. So I was thinking like, you know, it would be pretty cool if you could like take that AV file and kind of stream it into VLC in real time because then we could kind of, you know, watch videos in real time. And as more and more people watch the video, the storm would be stronger, so we would kind of not have lag. That's pretty cool. So I made this program called PeerFlex that kind of does this using TorrentStream. Um, so I have that written here. So you basically just, oh. you basically just call PeerFlex with the magnet link and a dash dash VLC. Uh, and it, it will start fetch the data. So it opened up on my desktop here, so I just need to move it. So this is, this is the actual video streaming in real time, and the video has 12 seconds of black in the beginning. So that's pretty cool. Um, so, so What's really cool about this is that since it streams, it kind of also supports skipping because just just like reading somewhere else in the file, so I can kind of skip here, and it'll just like rebalance the swarm and fetch what I need. So I thought that was pretty cool, and then like this kind of works really well for for um, video stuff. But what about things that are not video? So I did this really fun project last week where I just took this technique and kind of like. Merged it together with Fuse. Fuse is, Fuse is like a real-time, uh, no, like a user, ba user space um, file system. And I made something I call torrent mount, which basically just allows you to take a magnet link and um, mount it as a drive on your disk in real time. So. So here I have the file we just saw. I can go in and I can see the files mounted on my disk, even though they're not there. This could be like 20 gigs. Awesome, nice work. Big round of applause for Eduardo.
Thank you. Uh, so, uh, my name is Eduardo. I'm a Node.js developer from the Dominican Republic. And I'm going to talk about MongoJS, uh, which is a project to use Mongo from Node. So, if you have used uh, Mongo, probably you have used this tool, which is uh, like a shell in which you can do really cool stuff. Like, if you have a collection, you can just uh, do, do something like this and uh, find, for example. Uh, and you can just find uh, all the countries, and you can also do a lot, a lot of other cool stuff, like you can skip uh, because it returns a cursor, so you can actually start from the fourth country, and you can limit the amount of results you get, like this. So this is a very nice API, and it's a JavaScript API, but in Node, what we have is a driver, which is a much lower level, lo lower level thing, but luckily there's a project to actually ha get this API in Node with callbacks, and it's called MongoJS. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of it. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. So uh, I'm going to show you like how to build a really simple uh, Express API using MongoJS. So essentially, this is a, a just a, a Express API uh, backbone. So I, here I require MongoJS. It's a Node module, and the next thing I do is I connect to a database like this using. Atlas, uh, uh, this is a, co a connection string, and this is all the collections I, ha I have in an array. So let's do uh, an endpoint. The way we do, like, uh, this is just an express endpoint, so we do app get. And in here we do db.countries.find, just as in the console, and we get a callback, which uh, gets us an error and the, the result here. So we just pass that, and uh, let's test to see if it works. Just run node index, uh, index three. JS. Work. Oh wait. Uh, yeah. Uh, three. Yeah. So if we go to the browser, which I have uh, here in my screen, so I'm gonna just put it here. If we go to the browser, uh, we can actually do three thousand five hundred, and we get okay true. And if we go to the countries. Uh, countries. We actually get all the countries, and that's pretty cool. But normally, if we build a, an, an API, we actually want to page this, so we don't, we, don't have to, we don't want to get all the countries at once. So we can actually do this uh, like this. We just use uh, page size and skip, and we just use the same functions I show you in the, in the shell. So let's try to run this one. And uh, yeah, this is the four. And uh, if we go to countries, uh, here we actually get only 10 results. And we can actually uh, wait, page this. So we can do page equals four. And we actually get uh, next page. And so there's a lot of stuff we can do. We can, uh, using just the, the Mongo shell API, we can insert stuff. Uh, like uh, here with a post, uh, you can see how you can insert stuff. And you can use object IDs, which you also use in the console. So. There's essentially a lot of stuff you can do using this very simple API, which doesn't require schemas, doesn't require anything. Just using the, the same API used in the shell, you can use it in Node just using, uh, uh, just using callbacks. And also, a really cool thing is that the cursors, when you do finds, uh, are streams. So you can actually use it for building stuff that works with stream. So you have a very huge collection. You can actually uh, pipe it through other streams, and uh, like JSON stringify and that kind of thing. And uh, so yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Hola to Tom. Uh, my name is Pablo, and my presentation is not so technical, but I think it's also really important because it talks about decision. And we are engineers, and uh, our, main, our main job is to take the right decisions, right? So this is a crazy name, minimally software engineers, but it's 10 guidelines to take better decisions as an engineer. And the first one is five for, for Pareto. This is a rule, which is the Pareto rule, and it says that 20% of our efforts are gonna give us the 80% of the results, right? So one of the things we have to focus is on, fi on finding our 20%, this 20% that is gonna create great impact. One example of that was this morning, um, Reginald was talking about uh, closures, uh, and he was talking about good magic and bad magic, right? Like the good magic is what this 20% would be, and 
the closure is such a simple uh, change of syntax that give us amazing results. Uh, the second guideline would be prioritize. Uh, people ask me, wow, well, minimalist is about not doing things, right? How, who is gonna hire you as an engineer if you don't do things? So no, 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 minimalism is about doing things that matter first. If we had all the resources that we wanted, we could do everything. But we know, we know it's not true, so it's focusing on the, first, on the most important things first. Perfect is enemy of the good. This is an amazing quote. Um, we, we got crazy uh, with our projects and we tried to make them perfect before we released them. Uh, just, you know, if you have the opportunity to talk today, just do it, even if your work is not completely perfect. And uh, Adios Mani, a great JavaScript developer, has a quote that I love and is, do it, do it first, first do it, then do it better, then do it right, okay? So that's super important. Also, you know, in your day by day, you're gonna see that iteration is your, is your friend. And, well, having unit tests helps you iterate uh, better. And also you see that in nature, right? If you think about nature, any, any given enough complex system has evolved some, from something more primitive, right? That's evolution. Something that has a lot of flaws is iterating and becoming better. Another powerful uh, guideline is kill the baby. This is from one of my friends. Uh, designers have projects that are, they don't last as much as uh, we engineers, we normally have two months project, three months project, even a year project. So they have probably one week project, two weeks project. So they know, they know it's better, right? If you're working on a project and you see it's not going anywhere, even if you love your code, we all love well written code. All the code is here uh, for, a, you know, not forever. So kill the baby before it goes, uh, grows too old. Add value, okay? So add value, is more career-wise, so my recommendation or what I've seen that works is every time you go to a new company or even to a new team, just try to, not try to be your, don't try to be yourself, try to be what the team needs, right? That's seeking for add, adding value to that, to that team. So, for example, for me here, I was the boring Pablo in Barcelona when I was working here. Now that I work in New York, I'm the funny Pablo, right? Because I'm from Barcelona, so people expect you to be more funny. So, and that's true. Uh, the, the best people I know, uh, they have reinvented themselves so many times, right? So I think that's a key for fitting on a, on a team, adding value. This is also career-wise, basic first. I think, well, we are here to learn a lot, Right, and engineers, one of our task, uh, inherent task is uh, keep learning all the time. So my recommendation on here is learn something that is, is gonna last, right? Because if you learn the new API of the new MVC framework, probably in two years it's gonna be obsolete. Uh, go with the basic first, right? A good uh, TDD, good uh, um, design patterns. So uh, learn things that last. Oh. And think different, right? Uh, no, that's it. Sorry, if you want to know more, uh, there is this minipeso.org with the rest of it. Thank you. OK. So we're there. OK, round of applause for Pal. Thank you. OK. OK, hi, everybody. My name is Pau. I'm from Barcelona. And I'm going to show you something that's really stupid, but I like a lot, which is GIFs and JavaScript. OK? so. Uh, <laughs> Um, so first, first of all, here we have a, a page. Uh, I'm going to allow the video conference to, uh, I like the video camera, OK? So you can see my face, OK? And we will stream that. So there's a URL here. I will open Firefox. And now, if this works, I hope it works. OK, you can see here, Firefox, you're receiving uh, the, video, uh, the video camera uh, input. Okay, but what is awesome is that is, this is a GIF. So we are streaming GIFs. So it's not uh, WebRTC, it's not Blackmagic, you know, it's just a normal GIF. So if you can see here, it's just a GIF. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, so what can I do with this? So I can download it, so I can have the whole uh, 
you know, that's a video conference. I can have it on my laptop as a huge GIF. I can also imagine that Twitter allowed avatars with, uh, you know, like URLs instead of uploading one. I could have a real-time avatar so everybody could see myself on real time. So that, that's the that's whole point, no? Like we have now WebSockets, we have Node.js that has streams, we have uh, APIs that allow us to take things from the camera, put it on a canvas, uh, put it into Node.js, streaming through WebSockets through multiple clients, and all I do is uh, GIFs, you know? So GIFs are awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, Francesco is talking about open web apps and Firefox OS. Round of applause, Francesco. Everybody, how are you? I'm, I think I'm the last one. I am. Hope you had fun till now, so far. Um, I'm Francesco Jovine, and uh, this is my Twitter and all the, all the stuff. I, I live in Rome, Italy. I'm here for this conference. And I like one year ago, I started uh, you know, attending uh, conferences across Europe. I couldn't stop. And this is, this is why I'm here. And I love playing football table. It's called a football in here, I think. And if someone has share the same passion, please let me know, because I'm looking for, for people to play with. <laughs> I'm going to, talk, to tell you about the, uh, the MDN App Center, the project that I'm contributing to. Uh, and I, want to I would like to, to share uh, some of my, of my work on, uh, on the platform and, uh, and some cool demos that I wrote for, uh, for MDN. Uh, I'm focusing on uh, device APIs. So I'm focusing on uh, um, the touch geolocation contacts, uh, other stuff uh, can, uh, can allows you to, to, to access the uh, sensors and uh, and services of, of the phone or the device in which the application is running. Starting with geolocation, this is a, a demo I, I wrote. Uh, you can switch uh, among OpenStreetMap, Google Maps, or an Android map. Uh, get the current position pass some, some parameters and perform searches. The code is on GitHub. And this is the article that, uh, that, uh, that I wrote about it. And uh, I, um, I, I spoke at some meetups in Rome in Italy about uh, the work I'm doing. And I get a lot of feedback. And uh, that uh, has been helpful, helpful for, uh, for my work for, for MDN. On the top of this contacts web app, I developed um, 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 an application for Firefox OS. Uh, get, get access to the to the address book uh, of the phone and place. This is my face, for example, in my room, and uh, and place the um, all the contacts of your address book in, in on the map. Again, that's, uh, uh, the code is on GitHub. And there's an article that explains step by step how I did. What about motion? I developed a very simple game compared to, uh, to the one <laughs> you, you, said, you said before. It's not good looking, but it works quite well. And uh, the, the good thing here is that you can control the ball with device orientation API. And you can jump the obstacles. It's something <laughs> funny. Just moving your device like that. Doesn't work quite well, but. No, <laughs> it's good for documentation. It's, uh, if you want to try it, the link is, the, the link is uh, um, I, I will share the slides, so it's, uh, I think it's complicated to, to write it now. Again, and the article, OK? This is cool. Access the, 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 ambient, uh, the ambient light from a uh, sensor of your device. I developed a Christmas dim demo that changed the color of the sky uh, uh, depending on the luminosity of the of the room in which you are uh, you're staying. And uh, I put this Christmas tree in a in a in a tablet. I mean, in a, in an e-book application, 
for, uh, for uh, they call it Christmas tales, for example. And uh, when the light, when you turn off the light, uh, you know, the, the light of the Christmas tree turns on and, uh, and starts snowing. And it's, it's quite interesting. Not useless, but it's interesting for documentation. Again, oh my god, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Francesco.